Thank you. Thank you so much for, uh, for that warm welcome. Mm -hmm. I, I appreciate it. I hope you felt that too. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the warmth. Thank you. As uh, I, I think I just uh, mentioned briefly when we were backstage, this, and I don't, said, I don't think I framed it like this, but this maybe is what I would call the unofficial uh, finale on the unofficial living Black History Month here in Denmark. Because <laughs> in just three weeks, we've had Trevor Noah, we've had Angela Davis, in conversation with Renier Dolodge, and a couple of days ago, we had Barack Obama. Now we have you. I think, I think we can say that I'm in fairly good company. I think you are in fairly good company. Would you... Uh, would you would you have dreamed that, or many years ago when you started getting published first, that that, that would be the lineup you were, <laughs> you were to round off? Yes. <laughs> no, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, I'm joking, I'm joking. Um, no, no, no. I, I don't think, I didn't dream in specifics. I, I think I always, my biggest dream was to be read. I wanted to write things, and I really hoped that I would be read. That was really my biggest dream. Mm. I think it's safe to say that that is, uh, that that is going fairly <laughs> well. Um, you were last here in, in 2014, eight years ago, to, to talk about Americana. Is anyone in the room, were they, all, were they also there? We have, we have some, uh, some, some repeaters here, that's always a good thing. Um, a lot has happened in those eight years. Mm -hmm. And um, I think if we are to sort of, if you are to reflect back on when you were sitting on this stage last time, um, this international bestseller had just come out. The, the space you were in then versus the space you were in, in now, how would you, uh, how, what would you say to that? <sighs> hmm. Well, <laughs> well, I wasn't a mother then. That's mm -hmm. really been, I think, the most um, meaningful change in my life. Um, and I had my parents, <laughs> my uncles. Um, and I think maybe I, I didn't have, I think I still believed in, in American democracy. Mm. <laughs> um, that has changed. Uh, maybe I wasn't as, yeah. I don't even remember. I feel like the pandemic just robbed me of my memory. Yeah. I don't remember anything before lockdown. Yeah, no, I know, I know, I know what you feel. It's like time is being yes. it's being stretched yes. in in very weird ways. Yes. And time is something I would like us to talk about um, a little bit. But I think now you mentioned America as well, mm. and 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 I think for so many people, also here in, in Denmark and Scandinavia in general. America has been something to aspire to, a place mm -hmm. to look up to or mm -hmm. to compare yourself to. Mm -hmm. um, in, in Americana, I remember when this came out and the, the descriptions of Ife Melo, the main character, her meetings with sort of American culture, with, uh, with her own blackness, with, with all of these things, were, were something that I think to so many people here became a huge reflection and a huge mirror. And now I also have time, of, I have difficulty finding out sort of what should we look towards in, <laughs> in the US in, with the same aspiration. Where are your sort of, where are you looking towards? If you don't believe in American democracy per se anymore, what do you believe in in, in America, and if anything? De nada. You know, I, I think it's fair to say that um, the former president really shook my faith in a country that I call my second home. And so many things that I thought could never possibly happen in the US, because like you said, the US was aspirational for me my entire life growing up in Nigeria. 
And so many things I thought could never happen in the US, and suddenly they were happening. And, and I think that kind of thing just shakes the foundation of faith that you have in something. And, um, and I think that it has deeply, and I'm going to even say permanently, um, changed American politics, made it so much more polarized, made it so much more simplistic. And so no, I don't know that I, I, don't, I don't, I don't, it's not very aspirational to me anymore. So uh, yeah, I don't know what is. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I could tell you people who I find aspirational. Mm. <laughs> They're not Americans. Who are they? <laughs> well, there's a Congolese doctor called Dr. Dennis Mukwege, mm -hmm. who um, I'm just reading about him. Well, so he's just the most fantastic human in the world. So he, he's done so much work with women, um, women who were victims of, of rape um, during the war. And I'm just reading his book now, and I remember just thinking, we live in a world in which we are starved of heroes, and I found one. <laughs> That's beautiful. I think you might also have been a hero to a lot of people in that context. <laughs> um, I know that some feel that that are sitting in this audience, uh, because they've personally told me uh, in the days leading, leading up to this. Um, and this conversation, I think, or I have felt very much, has been has been awaited with with big anticipation. It was it was it was sold out really quickly, and it was people have been on fire, um, <laughs> literally. Um, <laughs> That's worrying. <laughs> it kind of is. Um, but but now that you mentioned this sort of this polarization, I was I was I was going to bring it up a little bit later, but I'm I'm going to ask now because I think it goes. It goes back to, to one of the first things that I, I, I remember sort of from you, which was uh, your TED talk, the, the Danger of a Single Story, that was very impactful, um, and where you are addressing what it, what it, if I'm paraphrasing now, what it does to someone to be sort of only, um, only see a very specific reflection of the world. Yeah. And then I, I read a recent interview with you where you talked about the, I think you called it the danger of sort of ideological purity mm. um, that, that, that is this polarization. Would you elaborate a little bit on that? Because I think those are mm. sort of connected as a strand. I think, you know, I, I remember I was having a conversation with um, a friend recently and I said, I don't even like watching or reading the news in the US anymore because even the, the news is now ideological. It's almost as though um, objective fact doesn't exist anymore. And so I'll give you an example. In the US, there's all of this talk about something called critical race theory, mm. which in many ways, half the people who say do not know what it means. The other half just think nobody should talk about race. And it seems to me very strange because for a country like the US, I mean, race is the foundational um, uh, issue, I think, in America. And it just seems to me there are objective facts of history. There are things that happen. Children should know about those things. But somehow the conversation then becomes, um, if you're on one side of the debate, and you have certain, you have, your, you have your own facts. If you're on the other side, you have your own facts. And it's, you know, it's not just boring. It's also very, um, I don't know, demoralizing. And and, and I think also it is, in fact, possible to occupy one ideological side and still see a kind of value on the other side. Mm. So I like to know what people who do not agree with me think, mostly just so that I can prove them wrong. Right? Right. But, <laughs> but to be able to do that, you need to know what they think. And there's a kind of, this kind of purity that I think we now have where not only are we all supposed to toe a certain line, but we're also supposed to be perfect. You know, there, there is, it seems to me that, you know, curiosity is dying, um, that, that capacity to be human and flawed is also dying. Mm. You know, I think that people are, um, I think we live in a world that is so much less forgiving, and I think that's a sad thing. But also as a creator, I worry about the kind of art and the kind of literature that we will produce in 20 years. How mm. so? Because, um, 
because we are running away from the truth in all kinds of ways. So, so a child in the US today who isn't taught the fundamental basics of American history, um, and in 20 years that child wants to tell stories, I don't know what stories that child will tell about America, they will be lies. You know, so I think, yeah. And then how do you, because I think there are, about, there are many, many very direct comparisons in that sort of narrative around that ideological purity and that very sort of polarized conversation that could also be said about Denmark and, and how conversations on, on race uh, is, is happening here as well, in, in so far that one of the constant things that we continuously have to do is to say that it's an actual thing, that racism mm. is a thing, that mm. this is you know, something that happens mm. that we need to prove mm. continuously, continuously, mm. continuously, despite it being a historical mm. fact. And it takes an emotional toll. It does, it takes an emotional toll. Mm. And, and I think we, we, you just briefly mentioned that emotional mm. toll, that when you were traveling and meeting black people all over the world, and yeah. especially in Europe, you, you felt that. Mm. How do you go about sort of exemplifying maybe or telling in your stories mm. a truth that is either not told, has not been told before, or can give that sort of broadness of perspective or that insight into to something that, that you've been missing yourself in art and literature? You know, I think Americana in some ways answers that. When I, when I, went, when I first went to the US, um, you know, first of all, I became black in America because in Nigeria I wasn't black. I hadn't black. We just don't think of ourselves as black in Nigeria because we're all mostly black and and we're too busy fighting about tribe and religion. So, but um, <laughs> and I came to the U.S. and I, I realized that I had this new identity that had been given to me whether or not I wanted it, and it was based on how I looked. And not only did I have this new identity, this new identity came with a lot of baggage, many negative stereotypes. And for me, coming from a place where um, blackness really did not equal inferiority. And I remember my initial reactions being a kind of amused contempt. I thought, these people are crazy. I mean, why do you think black people are inferior? You're mad, you know, that sort of thing. And then I started reading American history to understand racism and race. And you know, it's interesting because there's certain things that happen to you when you don't quite know the nuances. And you know something is off, but you don't have the language for it, mm. you know? Mm. Um, and they're little things, and sometimes big things. But anyway, so when I started reading, I realized that in nonfiction, I could learn about racism. In fiction, not so much. Because race is a subject in, in the US that is still, it's changing a bit now, but at the time, um, made people so uncomfortable that in literature it was only looked at in very oblique ways. So sometimes I would read a passage and think, Wait, are they talking about race or not? You know, you just weren't sure. Mm. So when I started writing Americana, I wanted to write a book in which you would be sure that I was talking about race. Right. <laughs> and um, really wanted to use my experiences, wanted to hopefully kind of make it funny in the way that many sad and terrible things can have humor in them. And also really just wanted to, to do away with many of the um, rules. So for a long time, I was a very dutiful daughter of literature. Mm. So I would sort of follow all the rules. And suddenly I thought, you know what, with Americana, I won't. Um, I'm, go I'm going to use bits of a blog where I'm just going to editorialize. You know, I, just, I was having fun actually writing this. Mm. But also I think what I was hoping was that I would open a door to a conversation that I thought was really important, yeah. which is not only that um, there is a reality of racism in America, but also that it's important not to talk about racism as though it's something that happened in the past. Mm. You know, it's not about slavery, right? I mean, I often say to people in the US, well, slavery was terrible, it happened, but actually I'm talking about 10 years ago. You know, I live in a state, Maryland, where, um, you know, 15, 20, 30 years ago, they were draining swimming pools so that black families would not swim. So communities would rather deprive themselves of swimming just so that one black family wouldn't swim. Mm -hmm. Right in the 70s in Boston, you had grown women, white women, who I'm sure went home to hug and kiss their children, standing outside schools and hurling insults at little black children. And what was the reason the children wanted to go to school? 
I mean, you know, you think about these are things that are very much present. And so I wanted to kind of, you know, write a book that I, I hoped would be honest and would open conversations. And I think my position as a person who is black, but not American, gave me a kind of, um, I guess a kind of platform. So in some ways, I, I, I think that I'm always outside. I'm outside in the US, I'm slightly outside in Nigeria. So I think it gives me maybe a clearer view, I guess. Mm. And, um, and maybe also there's a slight privilege in having that position because I think African-Americans, I think sometimes it's too easy to label African-Americans angry, which of course in itself is interesting because if you have that kind of history, you better bloody be angry, mm. right? But, so I think my position as a, what I call a non-American black, uh, yeah, I, I guess it's a platform I wanted to use. Mm. Um, and is that because I, uh, I actually, I just listened to, uh, to, to Americana these last couple of days as mm. sort of as an audio book. I've read it several times, but I listened to it this time. And having those blog posts that are in that book read out to you mm. is a very different... Oh, I'm mm. sorry. Is it... Is the audio bad or...? This is not working. No, sorry, it's getting in your hair. Ah. Ah, uh, okay. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Should we test it? Hello, hello, hello. Can you hear it? <laughs> Wonderful. No, but I, I feel like those, those blog posts are sort of... It's a very direct message that comes out of them, and it's, some, it's a very direct message that is different from sort of the, liter the, the, the literary tradition that you're also sort of writing into. And I mean, you have as part of, 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 of your... Um, of your oeuvre, you know, you've done, you've done talks, you've done, you know, TED talks, you've done books, you've done short stories, you've done a range of different sort of um, texts or sort of, of, of bits that can live in different places. Is that, a, is that a, a way of sort of positioning that, sort of being an outsider, being able to speak in a different way in one forum and then go back and and write in another way and then go out again and do something different? Or? I mean, now that you put it so elegantly, I, I want to say yes. <laughs> but actually, <laughs> but actually it's, I'm also it's framing <laughs> the question very directly. <laughs> but it, but it's, I don't think it, it's not conscious. It's never been. And I, I should say that the love of my life is literature. I mean, the, the thing that I deeply love is literature. Um, and it's, you know, it's reading stories, it's writing them. And I really love that the gray areas, you know. But at the same time, I think when you're a lover of literature, you're also a citizen, right? You're also a person who lives in the world. So I'm a lover of literature, I love the gray areas, but I also have a Nigerian passport, right? <laughs> Which means that I am forced to confront the reality of, um, you know, applying for visas and people telling you you're lying, or, or actually the la one of the times I came to Denmark, I have to say this time it was very good at immigration, shockingly. Because one time, one time that I came, um, and I love telling the story, so I, I give him my Nigerian passport here in Copenhagen, and he says, why are you here? And I say, I'm a writer, and he says, writer. And he looks at the passport and he says, step aside. And he kept me there for, I don't know, 30 minutes. Mm. And I felt like a criminal. And so later, I was very kindly um, informed that because Denmark had a problem with Nigerian sex workers, he must have assumed I was a sex worker. <laughs> so anyway, this is just to say that <laughs> you cannot hide behind being an artist. You're an artist and also a citizen. And I think my art gave me a platform. And there are things I care about as a citizen. And so I decided to use that platform to talk about those things I care about. So I care, I, as a child, you know, I was the child who was very much aware of injustice. I was the child who would think, why is the domestic worker being treated badly? You know, I was the child who would ask questions. So I've always been alert to just what isn't right and what isn't humane. And so my platform as a writer meant that I could talk about those things. So I talked about, you know, how important it is that we acknowledge and celebrate um, the ways in which we're different, how many stories matter. I am fiercely feminist in my worldview, and I, I thought I would talk about that. Um, you know, I discovered racism in America, and I thought, yeah, I'll write a novel about that. So, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's not so much, I, I, wish, I wish I 
I wish we lived in a world that were a bit more fair and just. Mm. And if we did, I wouldn't be doing TED Talks. I would just be lying in bed reading poetry all day. Right. <laughs> right. I think I can... Uh... <laughs> I would, if you, if you like poetry, I would, I would recommend some of the newer voices that are also happening here, that, like are, that, that are also new voices on, on the stage who are also very uh, direct in writing about, mm. vo uh, about race in their poetry. Mm. Um, there are several examples. Mikas Lang, for one, who is, who's translated uh, Notes on Grief into Danish. Uh, um, uh, Ayun There are several, several, several people. Uh. Yes, Sadak. Um, one thing, though, that I, that, I, that I would ask you, now that we've spoken about your work and we've spoken about um, sort of how you position yourself, is to ask you to read it for us a little bit. Because um, I thought that would be nice. And um, this, now that we have you here, and this little, this, this section from Americana um, is and I've, I've readily pointed it out for you already. Um, it's, a bit of a, it's a bit of a section, but I think it encapsulates a little bit what we've already talked about yeah. and then what I would like to move further into. And just to give a little bit of context, we are, um, we are sort of happening with Ifemelo, the main character, and her partner, Kurt, um, and they are reflecting on race, on uh, his white family on experiences as such and of blackness in culture. Okay, I should say that I haven't read this in years, and so... So it <laughs> when, might be fun. <laughs> when Musa gave me the homework um, backstage, I looked at it and I thought, my goodness, I wrote that? Anyway, <laughs> so... And yet, once they visited his aunt Claire in Vermont, a woman who had an organic farm and walked around barefoot and talked about how connected to the earth it made her feel. Did Ifemelo have such an experience in Nigeria? She asked, and looked disappointed when Ifemelo said her mother would slap her if she ever stepped outside without shoes. <coughs> Claire talked throughout the visit about her Kenyan safari, about Mandela's grace, about her adoration for Harry Belafonte, and Ifemelu worried that she would lapse into Ebonics or Swahili. <laughs> As they left her rambling house, Ifemelu said, I bet she's an interesting woman if she would just be herself. I don't need her to over overassure me that she likes black people. And Kurt said it was not about race. It was just that his aunt was hyper aware of difference any difference. She would have done the same exact thing if I had turned up with a blonde Russian, he said. Of course his aunt would not have done the same thing with a blonde Russian. A blonde Russian was white, and his aunt would not feel the need to prove that she liked people who looked like the blonde Russian. But Ifemelo did not tell Kurt this because she wished it were obvious to him. When they walked into a restaurant with linen-covered tables and the host looked at them and asked Kurt, table for one? Kurt hastily told her the host did not mean it like that. And she wanted to ask him, how else could the host have meant it? When the strawberry-haired owner of the bed and breakfast in Montreal refused to acknowledge her as the checked in, a steadfast refusal, smiling and looking only at Kurt. She wanted to tell Kurt how slighted she felt. Worse, because she was unsure whether the woman disliked black people or liked Kurt. But she did not, because he would tell her she was overreacting or tired or both. There were, simply, times that he saw and times that he was unable to see. She knew that she should tell him these thoughts, that not telling him cast a shadow over them both. Still, she chose silence, until the day they argued about her magazine. He had picked up a copy of Essence 
from the pile on her coffee table on a rare morning that they spent in her apartment, the air still thick with the aroma of the omelette she had made. This magazine is kind of racially skewed, he said. What? Come on, only black women featured? You're serious, she said. He looked puzzled. Yeah, we're going to the bookstore. What? I need to show you something, don't ask. Okay, he said, unsure what this new adventure was, but eager with that childlike delight of his to participate. She drove to the bookstore in the inner harbor, took down copies of the different women's magazines from the display shelf and led the way to the cafe. Do you want a latte? He asked. Yes, thanks. After they settled down on the chairs, paper cups in front of them, she said, let's start with the covers. She spread the magazines on the table, some on top of the others. Look, all of them are white women. This one is supposed to be Hispanic. We know this because they wrote two Spanish words here. But she looks exactly like this white woman. No difference in her skin tone and hair and features. Now, I'm going to flip through page by page and you tell me how many black women you see. Babe, come on, Kurt said, amused, leaning back, paper cup to his lips. Just humor me, she said. And so he counted. Three black women, he said finally. Or maybe four. She could be black. So three black women in maybe 2,000 pages of women's magazines, and all of them are biracial or racially ambiguous, so they could also be Indian or Puerto Rican or something. Not one of them is dark. Not one of them looks like me. So I can't get clues for makeup from these magazines. Look, this article tells you to pinch your cheeks for color because all... <laughs> I'd really forgotten that. <laughs> <laughs> this article tells you to pinch your cheeks for color because all their readers are supposed to have cheeks you can pinch for color. <laughs> this tells you about different hair products for everyone. And everyone means blondes, brunettes, and redheads. I am none of those. And this tells you about the best conditioners for straight, wavy, and curly. No kinky. See what they mean by curly? My hair could never do that. This tells you about matching your eye color and eye shadow. Blue, green, and hazel eyes. But my eyes are black, so I can't know what shadow works for me. This says that this pink lipstick is universal. But they mean universal if you're white, because I would look like a gollywog if I tried that shade of pink. <laughs> Oh, look, here's some progress. An advertisement for foundation. There are seven different shades for white skin and one generic chocolate shade. But that is progress. Now, let's talk about what is racially skewed. Do you see why a magazine like Essence even exists? Thank you. How was it? Uh, how was it rereading that? <laughs> <laughs> that was written in 2014. Um, no, it was actually. Wait, it's been longer than that. It's been ages. No, I. I um, no, I loved reading it. I just. I had forgotten. <laughs> actually, honestly, I thought mm, that was quite clever. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I thought. <laughs> I thought you know, she's not too bad. Yeah. Well, first of all, it's, it's, it's really clever, but second of all, I think using that, um, that sort of cultural lens to talk about injustice mm -hmm. was, was a, a very, very 
effective, I think, tool as well. How, uh, what, kind, what role does that play in your work in general, sort of showing us, showing us things through, through or showing us uncomfortable things and uncomfortable th truths through things that we know from our everyday lives? How are you, how are you still working with that? You know, I, I think we don't live in a vacuum as, as humans. So the reason I think that I'm drawn in particular to a certain kind of realistic fiction um, as a reader and as a writer is because I think it's the kind of fiction that understands that we humans are, you know, we're deeply emotional beings, but we are also situated socially and politically. And it's important to recognize that, you know, I think um, whether you live in a place where you can afford your rent shapes the way you look at the world, you know, whether you live in a place where if you go out on the street, you're worried that a police officer will just automatically assume that you're guilty of something shapes the way you look at the world. And also, I think shapes your internal life. Mm. And so I'm really interested in portraying characters in their fullness. And often it means writing about things that are not easy or comfortable, but I've always felt that we shouldn't look away. You know, I think it's important if we want to change the world. And I think I have a, um, I unfortunately have a very strong Messiah complex. Um, Elaborate on that, please. <laughs> which has not always served me well, but I can't help it. So I want to fix the world. You know, this is the thing I want. Um, and I sort of have this, you know, ridiculous, I want everyone to be happy. I want justice. I want, and if we in general want to fix the world, we have to look at the things that are uncomfortable. Hmm. And I think literature can help us do that. You know, I read, you know, I read Balzac and I'm thinking, oh, goodness, this is showing me um, French society as it was with all of its, um, you know, all of its sort of complexities and it also shows you the failures in that society. I hope that my, my literature does that mm. for, for contemporary times. Right. I, I, I remember reading um, that you, um, or it's actually not reading, it's listening because you said it specifically in uh, uh, the danger, uh, the danger of a single story, that it robs people of dignity, yes. and so doing this kind of work and doing this kind of literature is also a way of repairing dignity or building dignity. I think that when you give people back, actually, it already belongs to them. But when you create um, paths for people to reclaim things that have been taken from them. Yes, I think we can repair dignities that are broken. And so I can talk, for example, as a person who is African, and I know that for so long, the stories of my continent were told by people who were not African. And, and as a child, you're growing up, and you're reading these stories in which people who look like you are always kind of the bad guys. Um, I remember a friend of mine from Kenya talking about how when he was growing up and he was reading these books by Ryder Haggard, I think, and how he always identified with the white people because the black people were also just stupid. Mm. And you're a child and you're, you're innocent in the face of a story, but it's doing something to you mentally. Because, because at some point you start to think that if everybody who looks like you is portrayed this way, then there might be a problem with looking like you, you know? Yeah. And, and so for me, it then becomes important to tell the truth, you know? And, and so I don't believe in telling only positive stories. I think that's also often quite as um, reductive and I think it's also dehumanizing. So I often joke about how I do not like the magical Negro stories, mm. you know, where all the black people are wonderful and everybody's a king or a queen, and it's just so boring. Black people are human, right? They should be allowed that full complex humanity. For so long in, in the history of storytelling in our world, they haven't been allowed that. And so I think that it's a gesture of returning dignity if we tell full, complex, human, stories of mm. people from you know this continent that i love yeah and also the people and <laughs> and also you know and also the 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 diaspora because one of the things that's really been very you know exciting for me is learning about the african diaspora you know learning about all the black people in latin america you know black people in brazil in colombia in mm. in peru right and also that there is a black diaspora in Europe. I mean, I remember going to Italy some years ago and talking to black Italians, and it just really broke my heart. This young woman who you know, had been born in Italy, raised there, and she said, 
they don't see me. And I remember writing that down, because I write things that I, you know, hoping that, you know, I might use it in a story. But there was something about it that made me think, how can we, how can we use storytelling to get to a place where this young woman feels that mm. her country sees her? Mm. I think being, being, being part myself of the diaspora here as well, and being, being, being born here with a, with a father from, from the Comoros, uh, so for those who don't know where that is, it's a little group of islands between Madagascar and Tanzania. Um, I think it's not only the sort of the, the rebuilding dignity, it's also being there in the first place, of, of showing that. I think in a, in a Danish context at least, it, it isn't just the fact that we have historically have, not, have only seen black people or, or, or people of color, people that I could reflect myself in as stupid or as bad or as you know, criminal. It was also that, that we're none. Um, and, and I think working with that now in, in, in where we are, that's also one of the reasons that I wanted to highlight this section from Americana, is because I think things in this, in this place in the world at least, have changed just a little bit, mm -hmm. in that there, there are actually a much more sort of visual side to the diaspora, to the black community here. And a lot of that, I think, a lot of that narrative and a lot of that understanding, I think, is, is reflected in, in that, because the visual side mm -hmm. has also started to change. We have found each other. We are talking to each other. Um, there will be a new show coming this year on, on, on DR, the national broadcast company, with mostly a black cast that takes place in a hair salon. I mean, <laughs> if that is not sort of a very direct link to, to sort of a window into what you are also writing about there, um, I don't know what is. But then at the but same time, oh, sorry. No, yeah, I was just thinking about, you know, the word slave, you know, I mean, the, the Danes did build slave forts in oh, West Africa. Okay. Absolutely. Just saying. I just wanted to make sure that that was... <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. You know, because, I mean, the reason I say that is when you're just talking about the invisibility of black people, I'm thinking, well, 250 years ago, you had forts on the West Coast of Africa. So what did you do? Like, I mean, all of, all of the inner city here is built on, or a lot of it at least, is built on, on wealth that, that is that is reclaimed from that. I think you are, you're pointing to a conversation that, that in a Danish context is still proving very difficult to, be, to, to, to even start, which is sort of confronting ourselves with, mm -hmm. with a colonial past. Um, but I think that's also one of the topics that I'm fascinated about, how you unfold so sort of uh, the complexities of that, the very still, stark reality of sort of, 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 of how uh, a lot of, of countries in the African uh, continent, Nigeria in, in, in particular, of course, in your writing, is still sort of living with that story in, in actuality. Um, going back to Half of the Yellow Sun, your first book, for example. Yeah. How, how do you s sort of consider taking those elements that you know are so uncomfortable, but so true, and think about how they will be sort of received in the world. When you send it out as, yeah. as a truth, do you, do you write it? No, I don't think about how it will be received. And I, in general, I think that anybody who wants to write, and I say this to my students when I teach, is do not think about your audience, because you're going to censor yourself. Right? You're not, you, you will. It's, it's human nature, I think. And so I just, I do not think about audience, um, in particular with Americana. And when I finished, I was kind of prepared that everybody would hate it. But at the same time, I thought, this is the book I wanted to write. And so I didn't have any regrets. And I have to say that I was so pleasantly surprised that Americans liked it. So suddenly I thought, I really like Americans. <laughs> no, <okay. laughs> No, but I... <laughs> I, I, no, I, I don't think about, again, I just, I really feel that um, we, we have to be adults about life. In other words, we cannot expect everything to be comfortable, mm. right? And um, 
And I, I'm willing, I'm willing to, that sometimes there are consequences to writing about things that make people uncomfortable. And I'm willing to, to face those consequences. If it means that somebody will say, I'm never going to read her book again, then that's fine. But the thing is, I'm writing what I really believe in. And most of all, I think intention matters. So I think it's important that we confront history so that we can make our present and our future better. Um, it's not confronting history for the sake of confronting history. There is, in fact, a reason for this. Mm -hmm. you know? And I think we're all products of our history. I mean, I, and so, which is why, again, I go back to the US, only because that's where I know well, um, this, this question about critical race, race theory. And often people on the right, the political rights in the US will say, um, facts don't care about your feelings, right? That's what they say to people on the left. And it seems to me that this is a subject in which people on the left can say that to them. You know, facts do not care about your feelings. Race is a thing, here are the facts, you know? Um, and it also shouldn't be about feelings. I sometimes think that maybe that's part of the problem, that there's a certain level of privilege that one um, has in the world that one then feels entitled to endless comfort, endless emotional and mental comfort. Mm. So, you know, from this place of privilege, which is also, I think, quite a selfish place, people will think, I do not want to have to think about my great-grandfather selling people because I didn't do it. Yeah, but your great-grandfather did, and it's a fact, and it's, you know, so if we are going to, for example, celebrate all the historical feats, we have to celebrate the other side. Um, mm. I don't know, I'm just thinking about what, what does Denmark celebrate about its history? <laughs> because I mean, I know that all of this, <laughs> seriously, I mean, all of this sort of infights in. So it was, did Sweden colonize Denmark? Mm, that's right. a sort of back and forth and back and right. forth and back and forth and back so, in Scandinavia. <laughs> so, so, the, so I'm sure there are residual resentments, right? Mm. Um, so in the pecking order, I think it's Sweden, Denmark, then poor Norway that suddenly got oil money. Is that kind of... Anyway, my I point is... I think it is depend what, depends what lens we're looking at. Right? <laughs> Ooh, Musa's Danish patriotism is coming out. There we go. <laughs> um, but really just to say, we're, it, it seems to me the norm is to celebrate all the kind of good things yeah. that were done historically, which is fine. I think that's wonderful. But if we only do that, then we're lying. You know, if you, if you tell half a story, you're lying. Yeah. And so I think it's important, in addition to celebrating whatever, you know, Denmark conquered, I don't know where, also to talk about the other things. Mm. Because only then can you have the full story. So that's kind of my, that's sort of my, just, that's how I, I'm, I'm really keen to tell the full story. Yeah. Mm. You've, you, I think that's very, very beautiful. And you've contextualized that maybe very personally in, in, in your latest book, The Essay Notes on Grief. Um, and one thing that struck me when I read it was the, was the sentence, and it's in the first part of the book, but grief is an unkind form of education that I think was so poignant and so beautiful. Would you maybe elaborate a little bit on that? Because the education part of it, I think, is also important in yeah. that context. Um, yeah, grief taught me. Grief forced lessons on me. And, and it was horrible. Um, I think before my, before my father died, um, it's been two years, it's still very strange to say my father died. Mm. You, know? you know, I had experienced grief. I, Friends I loved who had died, my grandmothers had died. But not, I mean, my father was, my father was the center for me. My father was my life's anchor. And when he died, I was just, I came undone. I really did. And I didn't expect to. I think I, I just imagined that grief is kind of the sadness, you know, um, longing, emptiness. But suddenly I was, learning that it's also about anger and it's about resenting other people and it's about sometimes even being angry with the person who has died and you know all of these things and i i just felt that i was being educated in just the most cruel way 
you know. Yeah. Um, but it's also an education that you cannot escape. You know, if you've been fortunate to love deeply and then you lose, it's, it, you, you just have to, you, you will go through that horrible, cruel education mm. that grief is. And how has how is that or how has that been afterwards sort of giving that to the world mm. and, and making that a, a sort of mm. a, both a glimpse into, mm. into, your personal, uh, into your personal feelings, but also in a way sort of educating others about the mm. role that, that grief can have? I hoped, you know, when I started writing this essay, I remember thinking I would just, I would get, just show it to my siblings. Um, and then at some point I thought, no, I want to publish it. Not just because I wanted to celebrate this magnificent man that I called my father, but also because I hoped it would help other people grieving, right? Because the kind of discovering all of these, I thought, I'm sure there are other people in the world out there who are not just grieving, but who are taken aback by all of the complexities of their grief, and that maybe if they read this, they will think, I'm not alone. And I really think that often, the most important thing that stories can do for us is to remind us that we're not alone. You know, there's just something about, about life that, you know, life can be tough. <laughs> and so I think it's comforting to know that you're not alone. And yeah, but it's difficult. I mean, even writing about, writing about grief is difficult. And I think this book is quite different from other things I've done because I wasn't protecting myself. So in my fiction, even, even when I use things that happened to me, I never use them quite as they happened, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and when I write essays, I'm always sort of, I don't let, I'm, there's a sense in which I, I protect myself, I, I, I protect my privacy. I, but with this, I just, I, wrote, I just wrote it. It just came out and I didn't want to hold anything back. And I think that's something else that grief does. There's a sense in which it, um, makes you so much more vulnerable, changes you, um, and also, I think, clarifies things for you. My father died and shortly after my mother died, so it was just utter devastation for us, my siblings and me. But one of the things it did for me was also to clarify what matters. You know, you suddenly think, we're, we're so fragile, like, you know, we could just die tomorrow and that would be it. Mm. And so because of that, what really matters? So it really clarified things for me, good and bad ways. What does matter? Friendship, love, honesty. Um, and so there, are people, so there are people I reached out to to mend things that were broken. And then there were people I thought, I do not need this person in my life. Mm. So grief really does clarify <laughs> things. Yeah. I think sort of on a, person, on a personal note, sort of reading this um, sort of quite, quite recently after, after losing a very beloved family member myself mm -hmm. as well, it felt like, like you did that, that you kind of reached out mm -hmm. um, and, and taught something. And the thing that struck me as well was how in, in the last couple of years, I mean, this has also been presented as sort of as, as, a, as a text that, that, that that bound people together, that was said in the introduction during the pandemic, sort of in a lot of people's lives there was grief and there was loneliness as well. Um, how do you feel about sort of the individual grief in a way becoming an emblem of a collective grief, if you could say? Because I think there's a sort of a dynamic between those two there. I'm always happy when anything individual becomes an emblem of something collective mm. <laughs> because, you know, because I'm a believer in sort of universal humanity. I mean, I, I kind of say that mock half mockingly, but I really do believe that. I really do believe that fundamentally in the end, um, human beings really are similar. We really are, you know. Um, I think the pandemic, yeah, I mean, I don't know if this meet people. I mean, I, if it did, I'm happy to hear that. Mm. Yeah. In, terms of, in terms of that becoming an emblem, I, f I find that interesting because as I mentioned in the beginning, um, Angela Davis was here um, two weeks ago in conversation with Renier Dolotch, the journalist and writer who famously wrote uh, why, why I'm no longer talking to, to white, white people, people about race. race. Um, we said that at the same <laughs> time. Cheers. Um, 
And one of the things that, that I found interesting in, in, in their talk, it was about abolition, was how Angela Davis, this, this sort of iconic activist, um, felt about fame mm. and about being that sort of emblem for something that has always been a collective effort. Mm. And it made, me, it made me wonder how not just you sort of react to fame, but also how you become sort of an emblem of all of your stories that all, of course, you write them, but they are all stories that are about family, that are about cultures, that are about human existences and about collectiveness, so to say. What did she say about? About that? Yes. Well, I think very interestingly, um, and, and some of the other people in the audience that were there may correct me if I'm wrong, if I remember uh, wrongly, but, but she said that, that she had struggled with it a lot, that it was something that, I mean, fighting for a just world and fighting for a cause and, and fighting to oppose a system isn't something you do because you want fame. Yeah. And then when you get it, you have to realize, or I think she, and I'm paraphrasing again, I think talked about how she had to realize that the fame was never her, as a, as a, it wasn't whether or not she was a nice person, or you know, how she lived her everyday life, it was what she represented, it was the action, the movement in, in society. And I think that was a very sort of mm. beautiful description maybe of, of that role. Yeah, that's me. That's exactly me too. <laughs> <laughs> she's um, no, she's she really is just remarkable. I remember having a, a lovely, lovely afternoon some years ago in her house with mm -hmm. her and some friends. That she's, um, I do think she's she's an icon. She's just utterly iconic. Absolutely. Um, and I think, you know, and I think that's a lovely response that she gave. But I also think it's very modest because, you know, there are. It does take something. It takes a kind of courage um, because there are consequences for her, right? And so she made choices knowing that she would lose out on certain things, mm. but she still made those choices because she believed in something. So I think um, I'm not, this is the reason I don't like being called an activist. Mm. I think the real activists actually did real things. Mm. And I just sort of, you know, write things. <laughs> Um, in, in Nigeria, activists are killed. I mean, you know, we had a, we had a military dictator who killed Ken Saru we were, who was an activist. And so sometimes it seems to me that activist is a word that I haven't quite earned. Mm. Um, I, I'm happy to be called a, I guess maybe a public thinker, maybe, but really fundamentally I want to be a writer. That's all I really want to be. And fame is such a, I love that quote, um, and I think it's Rilke, fame is the sum of the misunderstandings that surround a person. And I think that's so true. I mean, fame, <laughs> fame is about something that's not you. Like there's, there's the you who you know, goes home and, and hugs your family and, and you, know, um, you call your friends and you laugh and you argue. And then there's the you that people make up <laughs> and it often is quite strange, actually. But on the other hand, I mean, there are some, I think, I mean, you know, I talked about having this Messiah complex and using my platform. So there's a sense in which being well known sometimes can give you an opportunity to do what matters to you. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, you kind of learn to live with the other less um, appealing parts of, of being famous, which also can mean that people misunderstand you, sometimes deliberately so, and people think that somehow fame means that you, you no longer hurt, you know? Mm. Um, and actually, in some ways, it can make you even more fragile. Well, I, I made a choice some years ago um, to let go of what I think often comes with fame, which is paranoia, especially in this internet age where um, suddenly a friend calls you and tells you, I'm so sorry, they said something about you, and suddenly you think five million people are waiting outside your house with um, you know, guns or something to mm. shoot you. And it's never fun, right? But, but there are advantages as well, and you, you use them. So I'm grateful that I can talk about what I care about and that hopefully somebody listens. And also I have to say that when I'm in restaurants in Lagos, people always pay for my food. <laughs> so that, 
If nothing else, that is one reason to be famous. <laughs> I asked for my check and they're like, oh, madam, somebody paid for it. I'm like, oh, right, okay. <laughs> I like that. Uh, I like. I like. <laughs> it must be nice. Oh, um, <laughs> and you know, it's nicest when they do not come to say hello. Yeah. They just pay and go. Yeah, that's the best thing. Take notes. <laughs> um, I would. Uh, <laughs> I would like to elaborate a little bit on that. On that. Um, on 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 what you just said about not being in, an activist, but being a writer or not having earned that label at least. Is there then maybe a difference between being an activist and someone who just speaks up? Is, is that it? Or because I think you are speaking up, you are talking about all of these uncomfortable truths, but also from a dif different position. Actually, I think that's a good question. I would maybe say yes, but I think also, I think my positioning, so I, I grew up in Nigeria, I grew up under military dictatorships. I grew up um, seeing what it meant to live in a, in a, in a society that was really repressive, where my, my parents and their friends, who were all university academics, would speak in whispers, even inside our homes, when they were talking about the government. And I also saw what it meant for journalists, for example. Um, I remember as a child when this journalist in Nigeria, um, Delegiwa, was, was killed when somebody sent him a, a letter bomb. He opened it, it blew, blew him up. And lots of people were certain that it was the government. And he was writing about you know, corruption and that sort of thing. And so I think in my mind, activist then means a person who I mean, there's a certain, I think, a certain kind of, um, I guess, drama. No, not drama. Drama trivializes it. Um, I don't know. I just feel as though I haven't done enough to earn it. I mean, but it's not, I don't even really need to. Mm. Right? But, but the thing is, I, I do make the choice to talk about these things. And I know that the, it would be much easier if I didn't, right? Um, I like to tell a story about this young man in Lagos who, <laughs> at an event I did years ago, and he, he said to me, um, I really used to like you when you just wrote novels. I love purple hibiscus. <laughs> and then he says, but when you started talking about this feminism thing and this gay thing, I stopped liking you. And then he went on to ask me, what do you plan to do to make me start liking you again? Right. I, and I think he meant, you know, you need to shut up about gay rights and feminism. And <laughs> I think this was just about the time when the Nigerian government had passed this horrendous law that makes it criminal to be gay. Yeah. Which still stands in Nigeria, by the way, right? And so I'd written ab about it and, you know, really just wanted to let people know how just immoral this was. And so I think this guy wanted me to say, I don't know, maybe that I take back what I wrote or something. Mm. <laughs> So I said to him, you know, yeah, keep your like, right? I right. don't need it. But, but the point is, um, and, and not necessarily to appeal to people like that young man, but to say that, of course, if I didn't talk about certain things, um, it would be easier. Yeah. But I wouldn't sleep so well at night. There we go. Mm -hmm. Is that something then, because I remember in, your, um, in the Feminist Manifesto, with 15 suggestions mm -hmm. that you've written to your, uh, to your, to your friend yeah. who's asking you how to raise her kid feminist. One of those suggestions is realize that someone will not like you. Yes. <laughs> Does that come from that, <laughs> from that incident? I think, no, from many other incidents. Right. Um, oh, no, I, you know, I was, when I think about it now, even as a child in primary school, and you know, I have to be fair and say that looking back, I can see how I could conceivably have been an annoying child, <laughs> right? That was very diplomatic. However, <laughs> so you know, I would ask questions and mm. teachers would respond and I would be like, no, that's a bit too simple. And I would push and teachers would get annoyed. And, and you know, I, I imagine now, I, I can see, you know, this really annoying little twat who just will not stop. And so I think I learned very early on <laughs> that not everybody will like you and that it's okay. 
Mm. You know, it really is okay. I, I think this is something particularly for women, um, where we're, we're raised as, as, you know, from the, when you're a little girl, not only to be nice, and, but also to think that you need to always please people, and you always need people to like you. And you don't. So when I talk to young women, I say to them all the time, somebody will like you. You know, the world is diverse, and somebody will like you. And, and also, I, I say to them, think about yourself as a person who can like and dislike. It's not just that you're an object that, oh, he likes. No, you can also dislike them. So, you know, my thing is, if you don't like me, I don't like you, right? And so it's yeah. nobody's loss. <laughs> yeah. No, I, yeah. But, no, but really, I mean, I don't want to sound too glib. Um, it's not, obviously, I'm not suggesting that it's easy to deal with knowing that there's negativity directed at you. It's never easy, right? But I think, um, you know, you kind of think about what matters, again, for me. And so it matters to me where the negativity is coming from and why. So this young man who says, I don't like you because you talk about gay rights and feminism, I actually don't care about his liking me. You know, it doesn't matter to me. There are times when, um, you know, being disliked by a certain sort of group or people can hurt a bit more because sometimes when it's your tribe, doing the disliking, it can be hurtful. But still, you know, you kind of know that you sleep well at night, and I think it makes up for it. Mm. It also helps to have, you know, a really hot husband who loves you. <laughs> Friends. <laughs> a family that is very supportive. You know, those help. A great career. <laughs> can imagine. <laughs> I, think, I think maybe that's... That's a very important thing to, to take away as well in, in our conversation right here in Denmark. I think in, 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 in a Danish context or in a Danish culture at least, uncomfortability is something we have a very difficult time with. And so the sort of the pleasing thing, maybe especially for women, but obviously I can't talk on behalf of women, but maybe especially for women, but I think for, for, for society in general here, is a very difficult thing. It's very consensus-seeking all the time. We all have to agree. We all have to like each other. We all have to be merry and, you know, jolly and... And even, sorry to interrupt, no, but please. even sometimes the way, I, I think in addition to that, there's often an acceptable way of talking about difficult things. Yeah. And that itself can be very troubling. Yeah. So in the US, I'm often just deeply resentful and sort of, I just do not accept this idea that the story of race must always be one of progress. So um, in the US, both the left and the right, they will say, oh, look how terrible things are, but look how far we've gone. Let's celebrate that. And I'm thinking, no, you should never have been racist in the first place. You don't get a cookie, you know? Yeah. So, so this idea that... that <laughs> no, but really, it's true. <laughs> so I feel as though um, it's not just that we need to create room to talk about things. We also need to let go of that idea that there has to be one way to talk about it, and that, that way has to end with everyone holding hands. You know, we can be uncomfortable and, and we have to make room for anger. Yeah, and maybe also realize that if we are talking about sort of a diversity of humans and of mm. existences and experiences, the goal isn't necessarily for all of us to be the same yeah. or to feel the same yeah. at the same time. Yeah. It is a goal in itself to be able to hold all of that yes. difficulty yes. at the same time. Yes. I think you described that in Americana very well when you're, you're writing about how uh, um, how Ifemelu is, 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 is making money off her blog and is starting to do sort of diversity work, speaking engagements, mm. talking about that, and people tell her she's racist, mm. and she realizes that they don't want to hear about injustice, they want to hear something that comforts themselves, yeah. which I think is so true for a lot of the, yeah. the conversations that are going on here as well. Yeah. We've been around big topics, I think, we've covered, uh, and 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 a lot of different truths, and we have, we have 15 minutes left. I would like to, to end on maybe, hopefully, indulge me, a positive note. <laughs> oh, I'm, all for positive. <laughs> I'm, I'm all for positivity. Because um, I, I read uh, as well that, that, you, uh, that you, or you said that at the time, I don't know if it, if it holds any longer, but that you considered yourself a a pessimistic optimist, I think, was the, uh, was, the, was the phrase. But if we are to, 
to end, if you are to, to, to point us in a direction that you find hopeful, or places that you are looking for to find hope, hmm. what would that be? <laughs> yes, I, and thank you, Moose. I really love how you asked the question, which is you said this, and I don't know if you still feel that way. Mm. It's so refreshing. Because you know, you say something 20 years ago when you were drunk, and then someone, <laughs> someone comes to you and is like, you said this. Well, and yeah. I'm thinking, I don't even remember. You know, I'm like, I'd had two glasses of wine, I have a light head. So thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> and yes, I, still, I would still describe myself as, an optimist, um, as a pessimistic optimist. And I think it's really just my way of saying, fundamentally, I do, I think I'm a hopeful person. But at the same time, I'm a realistic person. So I think maybe that's what I mean about the pessimistic part. I don't believe in, um, I'm very suspicious of excessive anything. You know, excessive happiness, excessive, I just feel like it's not real. Mm. Um, but in general, I think I am hopeful. I, I believe in trying, I believe that we can remake the world. I really believe that. And I think it's really just for lack of political will and effort. There's so much about the way the world is that I just think it doesn't have to be. Right? Not that we will create a perfect you know, existence, but it doesn't have to be as bad as it is. And I mean in all kinds of ways, economic inequality, um, you know, the way that capitalism is practiced now, the you know, um, racial injustice, um, you know, women's rights, all of those things, minority rights, all of those things. And um, men's rights? All right, I'm joking, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to keep, we don't want to exclude anyone. Um, but, but, you know, to your question, where do I look? Um, poetry, seriously, stories. And there are stories that, there, there are things going on in the world, I think, that are reasons to hope. Often we don't hear them as frequently as mm. we hear the other things, you know? Um, so, you know, again, I talked about this um, Congolese doctor whose book I'm reading. Um, you know, and there's so many stories like that, people who do things that, that change things in the world. And so I, I look to those for hope. And I also, I have to say, really believe that um, human beings are generally kind of more okay than not. <laughs> you know? and, and I think I've always believed that, and so... What leads you to saying that? Um, I don't know, I think maybe the way that one is raised really shapes the way, you know, it's that sort of that old argument about is the glass half full or half empty. I think the way that, you know, growing up in a family just really cocooned by love. And um, my parents were just really lovely people and my childhood was really happy. And, and even though I was very alert to injustice as a child, I was also very secure. I think that kind of makes you, I don't know, believe in possibility maybe. Um, my, my life experiences have not always been wonderful, but they haven't, they haven't left me flattened. Like, I, I get up and I still think, you know what, we can still do better, right? And, and I want to change the s a small slice of the world. So when I, when I talk to, and I, and, I, and I mean the smallest thing, so um, the, I remember a woman at the airport in Lagos telling me how her husband i been terrible to her and how he was upset that she was reading my book because I'm a feminist, which somehow I think is a synonym for devil in his world. And, you know, she was complaining and I said to her, let's call him. And she's like, what? I was like, yep, I want to talk to him. So she calls him and I talk to him for 15 minutes maybe. He's an Igbo man, I'm Igbo, and I know how to sort of appeal to a certain kind of Igbo male fragile ego. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So I appeal to it, and then I have an opening, so I start talking to him about gender and women, and, and at the end of the call, he's like, I don't completely agree with you, but you have a few good points. <laughs> and do you know, I felt so happy, mm -hmm. because I thought this woman's life will be slightly better. He might be less of an asshole because of this conversation I had with right. him, right? Yeah. And so for me, that's, that's, I mean, so when I talk about change, I don't mean grand things, they don't have to be, yeah, I, I mean, yeah. I think, thank you for sharing that, for sharing that. Um, in, the, in the first place, I think 
I at least would like to to know then what you what kind of of, of next few bits you would like to, oh. to work on changing. Ooh, there's so many bits. Mm. Um, Let's start from one end. Then. Um, honestly, in Nigeria, I would like in collectively for to work on re the reduction of hypocrisy. <laughs> I would like to um, work for the recognition of the human, full humanity of gay people on the African continent in general, but in Nigeria in particular. Mm. Right? In Nigeria in particular. Um, because, you know, sometimes I think it's easy, especially when you're looking at it from a Western lens, to think, oh, you know, now there's same-sex marriage, everything is fine, but it's not. And, and I think in particular, for, for this continent that I love, right, um, and of course, women's issues are front and center for me. I, so the small things I would like, um, to remove the pregnancy penalty that so many women deal with at work, um, to better acknowledge the reality of what it is to have a female body. I see that as somebody who, whose life was deeply, deeply changed by pregnancy and childbirth. And I hadn't quite realized, you know, and so, now I'm like, I think we need to have a ministry um, of <laughs> female affairs <laughs> where, <laughs> I'm not even joking, where, I mean, how is it that we can, how is it that we can, in this world, um, transplant hearts, but we cannot solve PMDD and PMS? Mm. Well, I think... Maybe historically, because every ministry has been a ministry of male affairs. Yeah. So I want to change that. That's right. that, yeah, I want to change that. I want, I want the world to stop being modeled on maleness, but instead be modeled on both. Yeah. So, so it's a very long list, as you can see. <laughs> it's, one, it's one step at a time. <laughs> it is, right? It's one step at a time. If, but if you're also doing things. Well, thank you. And, you know, right, isn't he? Right. <laughs> Thank you. And, and you must also know that sometimes you, you want to change everything in one full swoop, and you know you can't. So you make choices. Absolutely. But I think one of, one of the things, and I think that's the reason that example you gave earlier is so, is so poignant, is that, that in these very polarizing and polarized mm. times, as you, as you mentioned in the beginning, that glimpse of, of human hope, I think maybe is the best way to describe it, that it is when someone says, I'm not sure I 100% agree, but I actually hear what you're saying. Yeah. That's, a, that's such a rare thing for yes. people to say these days, yes. which is very frightening, yes. I think. Yes. And, and I think so many things in, in, your, in, in the whole catalog of, of work that you've done is helping sort of dismantling those things, maybe because they give people tools to mm -hmm. go out and do them themselves. What would, what would you hope to talk about if you were to come back on this stage in eight years <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and rejoice, hopefully? <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know. Well, I'm hoping it will be maybe four years, not eight. Mm. Um, I'm only saying eight. No, I know, I'm kidding. I know, of course, it's, of course. It's a wonderful symmetry. Yeah, I hope you come back sooner. But I, I think I'm also kind of poking fun of myself and hoping I would have finished a book in the next four years. That's kind of what, you yeah. um, know. What would I like to talk about? What would I... I'm hoping that in the next eight years, I suppose, w that we will have less to be pessimistic about in general. That if I had the conversation with you, that I wouldn't feel as I do that you are burdened by so many of the things that are realities in Denmark. Yeah, so in eight years I would, um, yeah, hope that you would have less to do. I mean, I was struck by what you said about, it's not just um, telling the different stories, it's also just about being visible. Mm. And you said, and I love that line, we know each other now, we now talk to each other. I found that very moving. And I'm hoping that in eight years, it won't be as poignant, it will be more ordinary. Yeah. 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 I, uh, 
I, I second that. I also hope it doesn't, it won't take eight years yeah. again. <laughs> um, and I think that one thing sort of to, 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 f to, f to end on as well maybe is, is that that reality of the everyday, maybe of the ordinary, um, and, and the way that, that you are showcasing that to us in, in all of your works, I think has, has, has literally been, also from a personal experience here, a, a sort of a way of showing that hope, mm -hmm. of, of showing that this is also just an everyday reality, but it is real mm -hmm. and it is important. Yep. And thank you so much for giving us that and for sharing that with us. Thank I you, Musa. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think this is where we do a collective bow. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah.